Chapter One The Little Flower Girl There stood our daisy. What a fair, sweet floweret. She looked as pure and sweet as the blossoms over which she bent. She stood beside her basket of flowers. Daisy, with her flowers, was a little spot of brightness and beauty amidst all the dust, heat and turmoil of the noisy street on that warm summer afternoon. The street ran beside a large railroad depot. Porters, carmen and travellers called out, shouting and swearing. Passengers hurried by to catch the trains that started every few minutes. Carriages drove up with their loads of ladies and children. Further down the street, porters unloaded express wagons filled with freight and baggage with a large amount of noise and crash. Amongst all this confusion stood Daisy, opposite the door of the ladies' entrance. The passers-by did not know that she was a Daisy, or that what she held so lovingly were her namesakes. Now and then a passer-by stopped to buy one of the five or ten cent bouquets. As they purchased a bouquet from her basket, most spoke a kind word to the child. Something in Daisy's look and manner pleaded for tenderness and sympathy. The girl did not look like she belonged in the depot. Even in her homemade dress, she looked so dainty. She moved and spoke like a little lady. She appeared accustomed to a different kind of life. All who noticed her, or stopped to buy her flowers, hurried on. They had no time for more than a passing interest in the child. They contented themselves with wondering and pitying. Down the street came a lady with a little girl. The little girl came skipping and jumping as she held her mother's hand. She felt happy and as full of play and merry pranks as any kitten. She had spent a pleasant day with her mother in the city. Now she was returning to her country home, with lots to tell and many pretty purchases. Oh, see, Mama, she said as her eye fell upon Daisy. See those pretty flowers that little girl is selling. She is just about as large as Lola Swan. Don't she look nice and sweet? Won't you buy some flowers from her, Mama? You have plenty of flowers at home, dear Lily. We have about as much as we can carry now, answered her mother. Oh, Mama, those little bouquets will take up a tiny mite of room. I want you to buy some out of kindness to the little girl. Her eyes look so sad, Mama, said Lily. Moved by the pleadings of her daughter, Mrs. Ward turned toward the flower girl and asked the price of her bouquets. What a pretty pot of daisies! Can I have that, Mama? asked Lily. At this, Daisy drew back. She put one hand over the pot of daisies she held in the other hand. She looked as though she feared they would take the pot from her by force. I will ask Papa to carry them for me, Mama, said Lily. Ho, ho, said a cheery voice behind her. You think Papa has nothing better to do than turn express man and carry your packages, do you? I wonder how many bundles wait for me in the depot to put safely in the cars. Lily turned about and saw her father, who had overtaken his wife and little girl. Oh, lots and lots, said Lily, jumping about with glee as she saw him. We bought something for everybody, Papa. I bought a present for your birthday tomorrow but it is a secret. Mama will fill it with ink. I will put it in your desk before you come down in the morning. You won't ask what it is, will you? No, I won't, said Mr. Ward. However, you must hurry and buy your flowers, or we will not find good seats in the cars. You want these daisies, do you? How much are they, my child? Again Daisy drew back. I cannot sell them, sir, she said. At least not now, not if. Oh, save for some favorite customer, hey? You see, Lily, you cannot have them. Well, pick out your bouquets. We will hang them about our necks if we cannot carry them any other way. 
said Mr. Ward. "'This is the little girl I told you about, my dear,' he said, turning to his wife. Looking at the sweet, sad face of the young flower vendor, the lady asked, "'What is your name, my child?' "'My name is... they call me Margaret,' said the child, with hesitation in her voice and manner. Her face had become flushed. Mr. Ward, having paid for the flowers Lily had chosen, hurried his wife and daughter away. As they left, he said to his wife, "'There, my dear, I did not say too much about that child, did I?' "'Why, no,' said Mrs. Ward, looking back to the small figure standing beside the basket of flowers. "'I find her very interesting. She has a strangely elegant manner and speech for one in her position. I wish we had time to talk more to her.' The flower girl looked after them and sighed a long, weary sigh as she watched the playful lily. "'Most all little girls have their fathers and mothers,' she said softly to herself. "'I do not have either. "'I wonder why God took both of mine away, but did not take me, too. "'Did he not know how lonesome I would become? "'I do not see what good I can do for him when I am alone, except for Betty and Jack.' However, God knows. Maybe he wants me to be patient until he's ready to take me. The wistful eyes brightened again. After watching Lily and her parents disappear within the door of the depot, she turned the other way, looking for new customers. There he comes, she said, as her eye fell upon a tall, broad-shouldered gentleman coming down the street. He had soldier written in every line and motion of his figure. His erect, stately head, down to the ringing tread of his firm foot, clearly revealed his military training. "'Good afternoon, little lady,' he said. He returned her welcoming look with a pleasant smile. "'Do you have my wife's bouquet all ready?' Taking from the corner of her basket a large bouquet made of choice flowers, she held it up to him. "'Thank you, sir,' she said, as she received the price. With her face flushed, she added, "'Would it be too much trouble to carry this to the lady also?' "'Too much trouble? No. How much is it?' he said, putting his hand again into his pocket. "'Oh, sir, I did not mean that. I want to give the flowers for you to take to the lady. I want to send them to her because you treat me so kindly, and because—' because you remind me of... of somebody. Well, I cannot refuse such a pretty gift so prettily offered, said the gentleman. Who do I remind you of? My papa, sir. You do look like him. Humph, said the gentleman, not pleased at the idea that he looked like the father of this poor little child. These are daisies, are they? My wife will like them. General, do you mean to miss the train? said an acquaintance as he passed. No, I certainly do not, said the gentleman. I shall thank you for the lady tomorrow, my little girl. As he turned to go, his foot slipped on a piece of orange peel, thrown down by some careless person. Daisy caught his hand as he put it out. Her support, although frail and slight, steadied him. The kind and generous soldier also had a quick temper. A fearful oath burst from his lips. "'Oh, my good angel, you saved me from a bad fall,' he said almost in the same breath. He used a very different tone and manner as he turned to the child. "'His good angel. Ah, yes. More than he knew, his good angel. Those little hands would from this time hold him from falling back into the sin he had just committed. Years ago, General Foster would never have allowed such words to escape his lips. Although, even then, he did not speak carefully of sacred persons or things. In the bustle and excitement of war, he, like many other brave men, had allowed himself to fall into a bad habit he sometimes took the Lord's name in vain. 
The general often became careless before men when his quick tempo got the better of him. However, he never or seldom used such words before women or children. Why, have I hurt you? he asked, seen with surprise her startled, troubled face. No, sir. Oh, no, she answered, catching her breath. But, but... Well, but what? But I am so sorry, she said. Distressed, she covered her face with her hands and burst into tears. Sorry for what? he asked. She gave him no answer, but shrank a little away. Sorry for what? he repeated, as if determined to know. The tone of his command forced her to answer in instant obedience, whether she wanted to or not. Sorry for those words you said, sir, she sobbed. Those words? What words? His question answered itself as he spoke, for his forgotten words came back to him. He stood scolded before this poor little flower girl. He repented from his heart, but only because he had upset this young child. He had not repented because he had offended the Holy One whose name he had profaned. Puzzled, he said rather impatiently, You mean to say that you never hear such words? Where you stand, rough men and boys mill about you all day long. Oh, yes, sir, she said sorrowfully. I do hear such words often. I try not to, but I cannot help it. It makes me sorry to hear them. I thought those poor men and boys did not know how to read. I thought perhaps they did not know what God said in his commandments. I did not think gentlemen said such things, and I liked you so much. Did she like him less now? He, the gentleman, the rich man, did not wish to lose the respect of this little child. He felt ashamed and sorry. He realized that the girl's innocent simplicity and truthfulness caused her to say what she did, not rudeness. The good-hearted general acknowledged his wrong. You are right, Margaret, he said. Gentlemen should not say such things, especially before ladies and children. I forgot myself just then, and behaved with bad manners. She took her hands from her face and looked up at him. An unspoken question remained in her clear, earnest eyes. Plainly, she was not yet satisfied. Well, he said, smiling at her, what troubles you still? Let me have it all. I am wondering what difference could it make, sir? What difference could what make? Whether ladies or children heard it, sir, she answered timidly. God hears it all the same, doesn't he? It can't make any difference to him who else hears it. She looked up at the blue sky overhead as she spoke. The look in the words brought to him a sudden sense of God's presence and nearness. The general had always known before that the almighty eye saw him always and that the almighty ear heard him always. However, he never felt it as he did now. The gentle, timid scolding had gone far deeper than the little girl had intended. Her hearer felt ashamed. He had confessed that he would pay a respect to a woman or child, a respect he did not feel the need to pay to his maker. He could give her no answer. You behind time, General, said the voice of another friend as he hurried past. The scream of the warning whistle told the gentleman that he had no time to lose. I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye, my child. God bless you, he said hurriedly. He rushed away just in time. As he boarded, the train started into motion. The jar threw him once more off his balance. The general caught the railing to save himself, while again hasty, improper words rose to his lips. However, the improper words did not pass his lips. He checked the words before even the summer wind could catch them. 
In their place, the angels carried up the heartfelt prayer. God, keep me from uttering them in time to come. The one seated next to him in the car thought General Foster remarkably silent and unsociable that afternoon. He would not talk, but buried himself behind his newspaper. If the neighbour had looked closer, he would have seen the general's eyes not fixed on the paper. The general looked instead at the little pot of daisies which rested on his knee. Over the delicate pink and white blossom he breathed a vow. A vow registered in heaven and faithfully kept on earth.